Okay, hey everybody. My name is Matthew Hacker Tepper. I'm a second year master's student in the Department of Family Medicine at McGill University. And today I'm going to present to you the core findings from my master's thesis entitled The Case Management Challenge, a systematic review and thematic synthesis of barriers and facilitators to case management in primary care. But first, a few acknowledgements to my supervisors, Dr. Isabel Vedel and Dr. Catherine Houdon, to my co-authors, Martin Yang, Eva Margot Dermer, and Melanie Lebert, and then to say that the funding for this project was primarily furnished by the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, Canadian Graduate Scholarship at the master's level, and that I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So in this presentation, I have three core objectives. The first of which is to introduce case management to define the key terms that surround it, and maybe explain why case management is important. I'd like to explain the methodology behind this qualitative synthesis that may be novel to the majority of this audience. And then I'd also like to discuss the core findings of our analysis. But first, the problem. As the baby boomer generation ages around the world, we're seeing an increased incidence of chronic illness. Patients who have multiple chronic illnesses are defined as patients with complex needs, and they experience suboptimal care, both in terms of the management of their chronic illness, illnesses, and their, the way that, that, that care is coordinated for them. This reality has several consequences. First and foremost, these patients tend to experience preventable or unnecessary exacerbations of their health. When these exacerbations happen, these patients tend to use hospital and emergency services to an extreme extent, which then inhibits those services from being available to patients who need them in an acute sense. So here's a more comprehensive definition of patients with complex needs. Like I mentioned before, they suffer from chronic conditions, many of them at once. They often also have mental health comorbidities or other forms of social vulnerability. They frequently use healthcare services and as a result require the coordination of not just healthcare services, but also social and community-based supports. That's the problem, there is a solution. It's called case management and it's defined as the collaborative process of assessment, planning, facilitation, coordination, evaluation, and advocacy the options and services required to meet the needs of a patient and their family. Case management has a ton of benefits in primary care. Studies from around the world have shown that case management has improved patient satisfaction and quality of life, the quality of care they receive, uh, psychosocial mediators, including confidence, adherence to care plans, et cetera. Patients decline slower. They use emergency departments less, and they are often less hospitalized or have a lower risk of being hospitalized because of case management interventions. It's all fine and well, but what we studies have shown is that case management can only take effect when it is integrated into routine practice. And unfortunately, implementation of case management into primary care has been challenging. Now this problem has been studied in the past, but there remains a relative dearth of synthesis of the barriers and facilitators that exist to case management in primary care. So what we really wanna know here is why would or would not case management be able to function in a primary care setting around the world. The research question we're asking in particular is, what are the barriers and facilitators to connecting case management in primary care from the perspectives of healthcare professionals? So what we did to answer this question was a systematic review and thematic synthesis of qualitative data. You're likely familiar with the methodology and rigor behind systematic review. You may know less about what a thematic synthesis looks like, so I'll try to explain it in a couple minutes. First, the search strategy we looked at the three largest databases to find empirical literature on this subject. Those were Ovid Medline, CINAHL, which is a nursing and allied healthcare professional database, as well as Embase. We developed a search strategy that was broad and inclusive and checked it against three studies that we knew should be included, but that were very different in terms of the way they were entitled or referenced in databases and the content they showed. So we kept building search strategies and making sure that these three studies always appeared. If they didn't appear, we made our search strategy even larger, larger or more inclusive to ensure that they would appear. The end result was a search strategy with just three core concepts, case management, obviously, an experience or perspective of healthcare professional term, as well as a qualitative research filter. These are the inclusion and exclusion criteria. You'll see that the data we included had to be empirical in nature, but not normative. So things like guidelines, handbooks, textbook for case management, would not have applied. At least one qualitative method had to be included. So mixed method studies that use both quantitative and qualitative analysis were included. Strictly quantitative studies 
like RCTs or surveys or cohort studies were not included. The setting had to be primary community-based care, so hospital, secondary, tertiary care setting were not applicable. The population under study had to be healthcare professionals. We wanted to know what it was like to be doing case management. So looking at the perspectives of informal caregivers, patients, policymakers were not relevant to our inclusion criteria. We wanted to get case management that was comprehensive in nature. So you saw that definition in that purple wheel a few slides ago. To us, the three core parts of case management involved patient assessment, care planning, and the coordination of services. So those three elements had to be included for us to consider the case management under study to be comprehensive enough to be included. Finally, we look at studies that were in English and French. All other language studies were not included because our research team did not speak those languages. Here's the analysis component of our, of our study. We used a hybrid analysis, which combines deductive, inductive reasoning with a deductive a priori framework. The framework we used here was entitled an in-depth analysis of theoretical frameworks for the study of care coordination by Van Houten all. This framework events 14 different aspects or factors that could inhibit or could promote care coordination in a healthcare setting. Now, we use this framework because it forced us to look at all the different aspects of coordination, interaction, setting that could be relevant to our question. But we recognize that care coordination is just one of six components of case management. So the rest of our analysis was done inductively. We coded our studies, the data of included studies, line by line to arrive at themes or codes that were consistent across studies. And we arranged those themes and codes into a hierarchy either above, below, adjacent to, beyond the 14 themes identified by the Van Hoot framework. So while we started with our deductive framework, really the bulk of our analysis was inductive. It was uh, loyal or it was um, tied to the text that we collected of the 19 included studies. We connected with a quality assessment and sensitivity analysis. That extraction and analysis was done in Vivo 12, which is a qualitative analysis software, and then our primary mode of synthesis was the thematic synthesis as outlined by Thomas and Hard in 2008. So here are the results. This flow shot chart shows you where studies came from and how many did. After removing duplicates, 1,572 unique records remain from these three databases. We removed over 1,300 of those records just by looking at the title and abstract, and finally they didn't meet our inclusion criteria. We then read 255 of the full text that remained, excluding 236 of them for the reasons you see in the bottom right of your screen, leaving us 19 articles in our review. This process, like all processes in review were done, were done, was done in duplicate with a second researcher. Here's a timeline of studies, and I like this timeline for two reasons. One, it shows you that as we get closer to 2018, inquiry on this subject is becoming more and more prevalent which is an exciting finding. The second thing that's interesting, is that you'll notice that in the, on the left side of your timeline, in the first decade of analysis, these studies all came from the United States. In fact, five of the first six studies came from America. Whereas you see after 2011, in the last eight years, we've seen multiple studies from six countries on the subject. So inquiry is not only becoming more common, it is becoming more global. To this is the kind of, final result of our analysis. We're calling it a schematic, and it represents nine factors, barriers or facilitators to case management identified in green or blue that have been arranged in a hierarchical and causal way. Factors in green are structural factors. They are factors that likely cannot be influenced or changed by healthcare professionals in primary care teams doing case management. Factors in blue we consider to be intermediate or malleable factors, factors that themselves are the products of the green structural factors, but also that can be influenced through policy or action. Factors in orange are macroscopic factors. These are not actual factors that can be modulated, but they are the conceptual things that are required for case management to work in primary care, which is that red box at the top of your diagram. Now, I'm not going to explain every single one of these factors. It would be too long and you might get bored, but I will highlight some of the more interesting factors that we found and how they can be relevant to changes in health policy or health practice. So let's start with structural factors. The, one of the most interesting structural factors that we found is the idea of family context. Family in these studies that we've included in our review is depicted as both the biggest helper and biggest hinderer of case management. 
families provide things like constant surveillance, nuanced information about patient environment. They can contact primary care teams during acute exacerbations of health of the patient, they provide daily task support, and often keep patients socially connected when they are increasingly vulnerable and isolated. That being said, families also require specific supports from the primary care team that need to be recognized. For example, disputes with regards to fines or patient care are often prevalent, and case managers and primary care teams need to be equipped to address these disputes. Furthermore, healthcare professionals require specific supports that need to be addressed, things like help with meal preparation or managing finances, scheduled respite care if their patients are particularly high need or burdensome, and they need to have the opportunity to share their experiences of caring for a loved one with other caregivers who have similar experiences. So all things that healthcare professionals need to look at and prepare for to make case management a viable intervention and to help families be on board to provide all those good things that we mentioned beforehand. One intermediate or malleable factor we found is the idea of team communication practices. The first finding here is relatively intuitive. It's the idea that personal methods of communication tend to be fair over impersonal methods. So primary care teams who have team-based meetings, who do team building, who educate together, tend to be more successful in coordinating care for patients who need it. Now, while in theory team-based meetings are promising, in practice they can be challenging. Components or elements like our egos, particularly of the physicians involved in the communication, different preferences or practices or low team morale can get in the way of this team communication that is really core case management function. Another interesting finding that we found is the idea of the hallway chat. So a lot of literature just suggests that having team meetings is really important, but ultimately care is coordinated, case management is done, communication happens in these kind of informal hallway ways. Times when you have a question for a co-healthcare professional, you walk down the hall, or you're going to lunch and see someone and ask them a question. It's these kind of informal interactions that are so personal that really make the difference in the care and coordination of care for patients. This finding really shows the importance of co-location, housing healthcare professionals in the same space. It is much more difficult to do case management and to accomplish the benefits of case management when healthcare professionals are located in different buildings, different physical spaces around a city or community. Here's another intermediate factor that may be interesting. This one is called time pressure and workload. Time pressure and workload or work stress are caused by several things. One, burdensome administrative duties, large caseloads, so caring for lots of patients, spending a lot of time with each patient cared for. And then this last finding is the idea that listening, taking the time to understand patients is not recognized as doing something or as an important or impactful act by powerful actors like physicians or policymakers, even though it's really required for case management. When time pressure and workload become unbearable, there are several outcomes. First, healthcare professionals experience a great deal of burnout or frustration. They tend to abandon paperwork first as they view it as an inefficient use of their uh, high order clinical skills. And the most concerning finding is that when time pressure and workload become too burdensome, healthcare professionals tend to operate in a standby mode reacting to acute exacerbations of health as opposed to proactively managing illness, which is really what case management is all about. So that's a real thing that we, that we try to avoid. Now here are the macroceptive factors again. What analysis found by looking at all the studies together and kind of going back through our data and looking through it was that there really are actually two core realities or factors that govern the ability of a primary care team to do case management. One is knowledge, so knowing what to do. That means understanding the goals and process of case management, understanding one's role relative to the roles of other colleagues, physicians, nurses, social workers, administrative staff, etc. Clarifying communication pathways, who do I talk to, when do I talk to them, how do I communicate with them, be that through technology or in person, and then leveraging patient information to provide the best care possible and to coordinate services that these patients require. Now that's one aspect that's pretty intuitive. The second kind of element we found is a little more novel, or less intuitive, and that's the idea of having the capacity to do, it, to do case management. It's not just about knowing what to do, but it's about being able to do it. That means having the time, support, and in many cases, the autonomy to do case management without fear of discipline, burnout, or negative consequences. Now, some of these findings aren't well explained because we've skipped some of the factors in the kind of interim analysis or explanation, but promise me, I promise you that they are there, and we can certainly discuss more about them later if you're interested. So 
Here's a schematic again. I talked about a few of these things, family context, communication, time pressure and workload, but other elements like policy and available resources, technology and the training in it, relationship made with patients and physicians, and then case manager autonomy and physician buy-in are all also really relevant to this, this uh, paradigm. Uh, we're working on publishing a paper relatively soon that explains all these factors in greater detail, so we can certainly look out for that, and um, if you're curious, you can learn more about, about this topic. Before I go, I want to advance a bit of a discussion by talking about a few things. The first thing I want to talk about was the comparison of these findings with the current literature on this subject. So the current literature on this subject basically exists in three boxes. There's quantitative reviews on case management that talk about the benefits or lack thereof that case management has on patient outcomes. We talked about those a little bit in the beginning of our analysis of, our, of this presentation. There are also two kinds of qualitative reviews. Those are reviews that talk about case management, but in a specialized chronic illness or a secondary care setting, things like case management for osteoporosis or for diabetes or for cancer. There's also qualitative reviews that focus on the experience of healthcare professionals, but that are not explicitly tied to case management. What our review does is really kind of takes the best of both worlds or two nuances from each of these last two qualitative boxes. Our review looks at barriers and facilitators that are present in these reviews, but that are about case management and specific to primary care. So that's where our kind of review exists in context of other findings. There's a ton of other research on this, but there's actually very little research in terms of the review and synthesis of actual barriers and facilitators to case management in primary care. This is a slide that's relatively important, and it's what, what we're calling implications for policy and practice. So ultimately, the findings of this analysis are only useful if the people who have the power to change the way case management is done or is funded or is supported do so. So here are a few core takeaways that we've identified for different stakeholder groups. Policymakers can use findings of this analysis to develop infrastructure that encourages the co-location of healthcare professionals, which is really one of the core factors or facilitators to case management. We should be an emphasis of facilitating training technologies for patient assessment and care coordination, which we didn't talk about, but is in fact one of the findings we have. And then a real an emphasis on working with healthcare professionals to determine the resources that are required to meet the needs of both patients and the staff that serve them in primary care clinics. Healthcare professionals can begin by finding a champion of case management who can inspire others to get involved in the process. Building genuine, trusting, collaborative, two-way relationships between physicians and non-physicians is a really core facilitator to case management. Finally, we talked about a little bit before, the idea of maintaining proactive care. So staying on top of admin duties, that care for patients with complex needs can be proactive and effective, not reactive and problematic. Fellow researchers may look at this project and uh, continue to do some more subgroup analysis to determine which types of healthcare professionals, be them physicians, nurses, social workers, administrative staff, otherwise experience or perceive which barriers and facilitators, perhaps not all apply to every, patient, every healthcare professional group, or to explore whether there's association between healthcare professionals, or healthcare systems rather, and certain barriers and facilitators. Certainly things that applied to the US in 2000 likely would not apply to perhaps a more public healthcare system in 2018 or 2019, for example. Finally, there is a need to analyze the number of literature on this topic. So I think the most fruitful outcomes or kind of changes from this project would be done when we look at both the empirical findings that we found and what the guidelines currently are for healthcare professionals and policymakers in primary care and to understand whether or not the research that we've conducted aligns or contradicts these normative guidelines. Lastly, this study has both strengths and limitations. The strength, or the most notable strength of our study, is that it gives a voice to the ideas and perspectives of healthcare professionals. These are the people who are tasked with doing case management and in the field of implementation science. These are the adopters that really are important to understand. So this is a really important first step in this area. Also, our, by, by creating a large search strategy across all countries, We've examined a diverse array of primary care settings, primary care settings that are privately funded, that are mixed, kind of hybrid funded, and that are publicly funded. And what we found are barriers and facilitators that exist across of these settings. They are highly validated and very generalizable. Now, there are drawbacks of analysis as well, one of which is that gray literature or the hand searching of literature was not conducted. 
So we may have unintentionally excluded potential valuable findings that would have helped improve our schematic and our understanding of this field. That being said, as, as reviewers, we are satisfied with the breadth and comprehensiveness of our analysis. The second limitation here is that because we are stripping empirical findings and putting them into kind of a more abstracted synthesis or review, we have lost some of the context described in each of these individual studies that might be relevant for tailored policy development. So if one were to take findings from this analysis and move towards changing policy, it would be advised to look back to these individual studies to kind of understand the context framework, even era in which these studies were conducted. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, want to talk about anything to do with qualitative research or reviews or about case management, please do get in touch with me. My email is below. I'm happy to talk about any of these things or to provide more information or data on the subject. And I'll just conclude by providing you with a list of references that if you're curious about, you can certainly pause the screen and look at them. So once again, thank you for listening. Uh, enjoy the conference and best of luck in the future. Thanks.